So we've been having a look at how uh, thermal energy arrives at the Earth. Now let's have a look at how thermal energy gets moved around or transferred in the atmosphere of the planet. First off, we need to back up a little bit and do some basic science. There's, there's three major ways in which uh, thermal energy can be transferred. And, and one is through conduction. And that's through actual touch. So here we see the person holding the, the handle of this pot. And if the handle's not insulated, of course, heat is going to be transferred from the pot to this person's hand. Uh, they're going to get an owie. Uh, the other method, of course, is through radiation. And this is what we see, for example, with electromagnetic radiation, where the energy travels in the form of a wave and travels through uh, space. The other one, and this is part of the one that's going to be most interesting to us, is convection. And, and this is where uh, energy is transferred in a fluid. Now, a fluid can be either gas, like our atmosphere, or it can be liquid, like the liquid in this pot. And what you'll notice here is that hot um, particles down here in the bottom, when they get heated, they rise up. Uh, but as they get to the top here, they cool off and use, lose their heat, and they fall back. And so we get these uh, convection currents taking place inside of a liquid. That can also, of course, happen in, in air, because air is also a fluid. So here we have a situation where solar radiation heats up, for example, the surface of, a, of an asphalt road, and the heat rises. Now, as the heat rises, it will cool, and it'll begin to descend again as cooler air. So it's almost like the cooler air comes back down to fill in the space that was lost when that hot air rose. And so we typically will get these convection currents developing anywhere in a fluid, either air or liquid, where the heating is uneven, where one part is hot and one part is cool. Now, here's where things get rather interesting. Remember that we're talking about a planet here. We're, it's, a, it's a spherical object and it's spinning. So what we see happening here is at the equator, where we're getting a lot of solar radiation, we're going to get air rising. So notice we have here air rising up at the equator and it travels to the north or travels to the south where it's going to cool off and sink and come back down again. It's going to come back down again to the equator to sort of replace that that air that was lifted from the, the warm portions of the equator. And you're going to get these massive convection currents that are taking place on an entire planet. So never mind a little boiling pot of water. Now we're talking about something the size of a planet with its uneven heating and cooling resulting in the, the fluid of the planet, that's the liquid and the air, moving in these convection currents. Now here comes the real fun. Remember that this sphere that we're on, this ball, this planet, is also spinning, right? It spins every 24 hours. And so we, it, we come up with an interesting effect called the Coriolis effect. And one way to illustrate this would be if I had, say, a cannon here on the equator, and I fired a cannonball directly towards the North Pole, you might expect it to, it to just go straight to the North Pole. Well, yeah, that'd be fine if you weren't on a moving carousel, which you are here. And so what will actually happen is, because the Earth is spinning, the path of the cannonball will actually be deflected in a curve. And it'll actually start curving towards the right, or it'll start curving, if you prefer, clockwise. If you took the cannon and pointed it uh, southward, it wouldn't go straight, as you would hope, because the planet, again, is spinning. It's kind of like you're on a merry-go-round here. The path of the cannonball will actually be deflected, and in this particular case, it's going uh, counterclockwise. All right, well, now put that all together on a whole planet of the Earth with its atmosphere, and you get these incredible global wind patterns that are fairly well established in certain zones of the planet. So once again, have a look at these cells here. So at the equator, right here at the equator, we have warm air rising up and heading north, where it's going to eventually cool down and come right back again. And this first cell here is called the, the Hadley cell. And in between these two cells, there's hardly any wind at all. This is the doldrums. So back in the days of sailing ships, if you were sailing your ship on the equator, you would encounter the doldrums. Your sails would, uh, would flutter flat, and you could be stuck there for quite some time waiting for a decent breeze to cause you to move again. Now, we also get uh, another cell that forms uh, north of this one. This one's called the feral cell, where once again we have this uh, convection current moving in a circular motion uh, up against the, uh, the, uh, the Hadley cell. And in, in this area, we get a famous type of wind called the westerlies. And we have another one that's duplicated again down in the southern hemisphere. 
Now, uh, here where we are working in Pincher Creek in Alberta, we're very, very familiar with these westerly winds that come from the western side of the mountains, and uh, they're quite strong and they're quite constant. We have an awful lot of windmills here generating electricity because we're situated right in the westerlies, and every now and then we get a really, really strong burst of wind called a Chinook. We also have another cell up here, uh, the polar cells, both North Pole and South Pole, uh, activating as well. So what do we got here? If you look at this, see these cyclical big currents here, we've got these massive convection currents that are taking place in our fluid gaseous atmosphere, and they're all happening on a spinning or rotating sphere. There's an awful lot of different motions that are taking place here. And so as a result of that, we get what's called the Coriolis effect. So in the northern hemisphere, we tend to see a rotation that goes this way. In other words, we're going, we're going clockwise. Whereas in the southern hemisphere, we tend to see rotations that go counterclockwise. So for example, a hurricane in the, north, uh, in the northern hemisphere of the planet, it rotates in a clockwise direction, whereas a cyclone in the southern half of the planet rotates in the opposite direction. And this is due to what's called the, the Coriolis effect. Add to this as well two other important ingredients, and these are the, the jet streams. If we look at the jet streams, we see that they're located between the feral cell and the Hadley cell, and between the polar cell and the feral cell. So in the junction between these different cells, we have the, the jet stream. So closer to the equator, we have the subtropical jet, and further north, we have the polar jet. Now notice that the polar jet is an awful lot more intense here, because there's a bigger transition in temperature, gives it a lot more energy. What does that mean? Well, if you look at the whole planet here, you can see the polar jet and the subtropical jet in both the northern hemisphere here and the southern hemisphere, we got two down there as well, twisting their way around the planet, kind of like a serpentine or a snake. Now, where life gets really interesting is when you, for example, have a dip in the polar jet, that brings down cold air from the Arctic. So you know darn well that if the polar jet's going to take a southerly dip, it's going to get chilly where you are. Uh, mind you, you know, same thing with the subtropical jet. As it moves up and down, further and closer away from the equator, you can get either warmer or cooler effects because of that. So try to see if you can put this all together in your head. We've got this fluid atmosphere made of a gas. It's unevenly heated. It's on a spinning ball. And so we generate these well-known, very patternistic uh, uh, cycles of air movement in different cells that twist in different directions, uh, clockwise up in the northern hemisphere, counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. Add to that, we have uh, jet streams that are twisting around the planet rather unevenly, distributing energy as they go. And you've got quite an interesting and dynamic, very, very active uh, atmosphere full of climate going on here.